Hello everyone, uh, welcome and thank you for joining our special webinar tonight for the 2021 March Banks Memorial Oration. I'm Professor McCallum and I'm Head of the School of Education here at the University of Adelaide. It's my great honour to be emceeing this event tonight. Now under normal circumstances, this significant event uh, would be held uh, on campus at the University of Adelaide um, but due to obvious reasons, uh, we're now presenting it as a webinar. One of the benefits of being able to offer this uh, special oration as a webinar is the increased number of participants. And I'm very pleased to share that we have over 600 participants on the webinar tonight. Uh, and people from across South Australia, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States of America, South Africa and Singapore. So welcome to everyone um, and thank you for being a part of our special webinar. The Kevin Marchbanks Memorial Oration is a biannual celebration of the legacy of Professor Kevin Marchbanks. He was Professor of Education at the University of Adelaide in 1974. He served as Vice Chancellor of the University of Adelaide from 1987 to 1993 and retired as Dean of the School of Education in 2006. Tonight, we'll be featuring the research of Emeritus Laureate Professor John Hattie, as he delivers the 2021 Kevin Marchbanks Memorial Lecture Webinar entitled, A Visible Learning for Parents, A Tribute to Kevin Marchbanks. Now, firstly, I'd like to welcome our VIPs who've joined us for this evening's webinar. We are very honoured to have members of the Marchbanks family present, and I'd like to acknowledge Mrs Janet Marchbanks, who's in London, and it's probably very early in the morning, so welcome Janet, and also Genevieve Marchbanks. Also, Professor Timothy Marchbanks and his wife, Professor Karen Fakwasen, welcome. From the University of Adelaide, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Jenny Shaw, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Vice-President Academic, and Professor Jennifer Clark, Interim Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts. Our philanthropic supporter for the School of Education, I'd really like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Peter Routley AM. Uh, welcome Peter and thank you for joining us and members of our advisory board. And they include uh, Dr. Nicole Archard, the principal of Loretto College at Marrickville, uh, Alastair Brown, the principal of Botanic High School, and Rebecca Clark, the principal of Wolford Anglican School for Girls, and also Kim Grant, the principal of Mark Oliphant College, uh, Susan Hart Lamont, the deputy head at Trinity College in Gawler, uh, Wendy, Wendy Johnson, AM, principal of the Glenunga International High School, Hassan Makawi, the manager of professional learning networks for our SACE board, and um, also John Muller, OAM, who's the Deputy Director of Catholic Education South Australia. Kath McGugan, uh, Principal of Mary MacKillop College for Girls. And Warren Simons, the Principal of Mount Barker High School. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Jane Lomax-Smith, AM, who's the Chair of the Teachers Registration Board of South Australia. Let me acknowledge that here in Adelaide in South Australia, we meet on the traditional country of the Ghana people. Um, they are of the Adelaide Plains on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage beliefs and relationships with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to Ghana people living today. So with that brief introduction, uh, and before I formally introduce Emeritus Laureate Professor John Hattie, just some little information about how tonight's webinar will run. You can expect Professor John Hattie to speak for about 45 minutes. Um, we will be um, taking questions at the end of the session and you can use the chat function uh, if you'd like to pose a question for John to respond to at the end. So use the chat function, please. Um, tonight's webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be available on the School of Education University of Adelaide website um, sometime from tomorrow, I would expect. 
I'd now like to hand over to the Deputy Head of the School of Education here at the University of Adelaide, Associate Professor Matthew White, and he's going to tell us a little bit about Professor Kevin Marchbank's legacy and about this lecture series. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Professor McCallum, for that warm introduction and welcome everyone to our webinar this evening. And we're really delighted to see so many people registered uh, for this biannual uh, uh, webinar, which we hold in memory of Professor Kevin Marchbanks and his legacy as well. And in these next slides, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background about Professor Kevin Marchbanks and his contribution to education more broadly. And I've titled it from Grafton High School, which is really where Professor Kevin Marchbanks uh, teaching started right through to his long enduring legacy at the University of Adelaide. And really actually Emeritus Professor Marchbanks is known in particular for his big picture, his output of over 250 scholarly articles, which focused upon the topics of inequality of education and informing and bringing the topics of data-based approaches to learning and teaching and developing a theory for the child's inner room and you'll see in particular on this slide here, three giants from the era of Kevin Marchbanks, Dame Roma Mitchell, and also um, Professor Kevin Marchbanks at the University of Adelaide during his tenure as Vice Chancellor. But it's important to remember that Professor Kevin Marchbanks was essentially a teacher. In Adelaide, he started in particular his teaching career at St. Peter's College in Adelaide as a maths teacher, then being called to higher studies at Harvard University, then appointments at the University of Toronto, University of Oxford, Stanford, and then starting his life's work as it could be argued at the University of Adelaide. His work is expansive in terms of its importance and alter inter intersection with topics in education more broadly, focusing upon the importance of family and cultural setting, and then also the founding role that he played in the development of the Australian Journal of Education and also the Oxford Review of Education. Some of his critical early publications focused upon really educational outcomes and then also the link between family and cultural setting, which brought him into great collaboration with other academics at the time at the University of Adelaide, including Professor George Smolich. But Kevin Marchbanks' work is primarily focused upon, in particular, the inequalities within society, and then also how this can also intersect with other topics related with occupational attainment of students, and then also their socioeconomic background. And it's this legacy which helps to inform the work that goes on at the moment in the School of Education at the University of Adelaide. So it's my pleasure now to hand back to Professor Faye McCallum, who is now going to introduce our speaker for the 2021 Kevin Marchbanks oration. Back to you, Faye. Uh, thank you, Matthew. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished presenter for the 2021 Marchbanks Memorial Lecture, Emeritus Laureate Professor John Hattie. Now, Professor Hattie is well known to many of you. He is an award-winning education researcher and best-selling author with nearly 30 years of experience, experience examining what works best in student learning and achievement. Over the years, he's authored over 38 books uh, and presented over 1,200 research papers and delivered keynotes at more than 350 conferences. Currently, uh, Emeritus Laureate Professor is at the University of Melbourne and he's Chair of the Australian Institute of Teaching and School Leadership. His most recognised work is his 2008 book, Visible Learning, which is a synthesis of over 800 meta-analyses relating to achievement. It's believed to be the world's largest evidence-based study into factors which improve student learning. It involved more than 300 million students from around the world, and it brings together 100,000 smaller studies. Prof Professor Hattie has been the recipient of the Headley Beer Award for Writing and Education, awarded by the Australian Council for Educational Leaders, American Education Research Association Outstanding Reviewer for Educational Research, Inaugural Secondary Principles Association Leadership in Education Award, um, elected Fellow of the American Psychological Association, as well as highly commended. And he's also been awarded, most significantly, the Order of Merit for New Zealand for Services to Education by the New Zealand Government. Thank you, uh, Professor Hattie, and I'll now hand over to you. 
Thank you very much, Ray and Matthew. And I want to start by also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on at the moment, the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and particularly the future. I also am honoured and delighted that Janet, Janet and Genevieve and Timothy and Karen are present today. I knew Karen um, many years ago when I was a young academic. I was a member of AARE, which was a very vibrant organisation, um, in many ways different from today because of the way the states were involved in running AARE and the conferences. And each year I used to meet up. It took a few years to realise that this person was as famous as he was, but he was interested in, in probably the first ever to introduce multivariate statistics into the areas that he was looking at, diversity and family studies. And as a psychometrician and measurement people, there weren't many of us. So we used to meet up and I found him, he was very, very generous, sometimes quite shy, um, but absolutely a font of all wisdom and knowledge. And so I'm very honored that I actually got to know Kevin and treat him as a friend. So Kevin, I honor your memory. I also want to start by looking at what I think is one of your most famous books, 43 years ago, Family in Their Learning Environment. And it was that power of, of the measurement that attracted me to that book, because it wasn't my major area, to see what you did. And your argument in that book was the incredible power of parental aspirations. Probably as a mark of the time, we've changed that word aspirations, but it's a very powerful word. And how parents had to get that balance between increasing achievement and learning and independence, and how some families struggled with that balance. You, he also made the argument about socioeconomic status. His argument was that it is important when families are larger, but the parental aspirations are far more important, particularly for those, for the lower achieving students and in mathematics. And he spent a lot of time talking about the different languages at home and school. And that resonates today, particularly as we do our work with some of our indigenous areas where languages are different. And any child that can speak two or three languages, Aboriginal languages and English, surely has got the capabilities to succeed incredibly in our society. But sadly, it's not as common as it needs to be. So he did get ahead of the game. And the kind of irony for me as I go through what I want to talk about today is that he kind of had the answers. One of the things he did was he went back to 1928. And actually, I read a review of his, his book. So one of the reviews is that he used old research. And I want to go back to 1928. And the study by Burks, very sophisticated study for back then, she actually used path analysis, which was quite remarkable. And she compared a group of kids, IQ, yes, that were in foster, foster homes with the kids of the foster parents. And yes, as of the time, still true today, but we're not allowed to talk about it, the majority of the variants were still a function of heritability and the home environment was in there. But look at the path diagram. Now, for those of you who know it today, it's backwards to us, but back then it was just the way it worked. And the ones I've circled there, the influence of the child's intelligence their ability to, and parents' intelligence very high. But the family environment contributed very little at all once the parent intelligence came into, into play. And that's kind of really fascinating. And it was one of Kevin's arguments that regardless of the socioeconomic resources of the family, there are other things that were happening that really made the difference. So I stand on the shoulder of a giant today as I come to the work that I want to talk about. I also want to mention Dr. Spock. Because like some of you, I was brought up in Dr. Spock's day. And similar to having met Kevin, I also have met Dr. Spock. I remember a very, very snowy Dunedin Sunday. And Dr. Spock was speaking at the town hall at two o'clock. So I trudged four miles through the snow to get there to find out that there was no one there. I must have been the only person to hear that it had been postponed to five o'clock. And I thought, do I trudge back four hours and then four, four miles and four miles back again? No, I'm going to sit here. So I saw the janitor and he reluctantly allowed me to sit inside. And about an hour later, 
this very tall gangly man turned up and he was there to talk about anti-Vietnam War. But I wanted to meet him because of all the work we'd done in, in child development. And it was really quite fortunate because I had three hours a one-to-one -one discussion. I helped him hand out his flyers and we became best friends that afternoon. And his big argument was, parents, you know more than you think you do. He also had the same balance argument that Kevin had about how parents need to see their children and balance their role of rule keepers with not following a one size fits all approach. And having that trust, which is so, so powerful. So again, I add Dr. Spock to my list of Kevin Marjorie Banks. And so do my work. In fact, I'm very, very proud of this book, which is just about to come out because I've written it with my son, who is one of the attendees here today. And it's really great pleasure when you actually write work with your son at that moment, everything he does that's good, I claim it's genetics. Everything he does wrong, I blame on his mother. But the argument here is trying to take the work that I've been doing over the last 20, 30 years and use the research to look at it from parenting point of view. Now we are specifically in this book, looking at parenting to relate to learning. It's not about discipline and how to handle difficult teenagers. It's how to develop learners and the role of parents. And you can probably sense that a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is acknowledging that many of those background variables that we get so obsessed with, like postcode and socioeconomic status, aren't as critical as many of the other kinds of parental attributes. And we've come up with 10 steps, the publishers wanna call it, we call it 10 mind frames. And our argument is that it's about how parents think about their role, specific ways of thinking. And what I'd like to do tonight is, I don't have the time to do all 10, but to pick some of them out and talk about the research that underlies these ways of thinking about being a parent if we do want to develop great learners. The trouble with Zoom, the dogs had a viewpoint there. So these are the 10. But let me talk first about the research base. What I've been doing for the last many years is looking at the effects on kids at school and at home and with their peers. And I've been building up, not just looking at individual studies I've done, but when people come along and collect the many studies and do what's called a meta-analysis, they base it on many studies. And what I've done is do a meta-analysis of meta-analyses. And I'm now up to 1800 of these. I have about a quarter of a billion students in my sample. And what I'm interested in is, can I change the question that's so dominate in our schools about what works to what works best? Because what I discovered is almost everybody I ever met could tell me what works in schools. Just come and watch me. Every politician could provide evidence that their policies worked. And hey, like you, I was a kid once. I know that it's not the case that every teacher has incredible impact. And so, and I look at this graph, it still amazes me. Look at the zero. There's not much at all that we do to kids that harm them. And a lot of things in that negative zone are perfectly sensible, like the effect size of bullying, minus 0.3. The effect size of boredom, minus 0.3. Perfectly sensible. And when you take those into account, 95 to 98% of things that we do to school, kid, we do to kids, enhances their achievement. All you need to enhance achievement is a pulse. And we've got to stop saying that we can enhance achievement because everyone can. I want to up the ante and I use the average of all the effects, which happens to be 0.4. And any teacher or school that is in that blue zone, their students are gaining more than a year's growth for a year, more than a year for, than for a year's input. And that's impressive. Excellence is all around us. And what I want to do is convince people to stop looking for failure and trying to fix it. Instead, why aren't we looking for success and scaling that up? Because we have many excellent teachers, schools, teacher education programs around this country. And how, and the visible learning story is this simple. Are we, have we the courage 
to reliably identify those schools, those teachers, those teacher education programs that are in that blue zone, form a coalition of success around them, and then invite those in the yellow zone to join. And probably the biggest problem in education is the lack of courage. We love to talk about the things that don't matter much. We love to tweak the curriculum, fiddle with the tests, worry about the structures of schools. That blue zone is dominated by expertise of teachers and educators and their thinking. But that's the school story, and that's not my story tonight. Here's a bit of a sample. And I, I, I'm not going to go through these, but I just want to pull out 20 or so of the top influences, and all of them relate to particular ways teachers think about their work. And 20 or so of the bottom ones, and they're all structural ones that hardly make a difference. Yeah, many of them are positive. Yes, there's evidence we should care about them. But relatively, mm, no. Let's invest in the expertise. And what you're going to see is what happens if I change the focus from schools to parents. And here's a hint. It's going to be the same. It's about how parents think, not the structure of families that matter. Kevin, you were so right. If you want all the details about schools, there is a free website called MetaX. Go there and you'll get all the details, all the 17, 1800 meta analyses and fine detail. That is not my story today. I wanna to go to families. The big underlying messages. Look down that list. There's not a student there. There's not a curriculum. There's not an age. There's not a country. What works best? works best for virtually every student around the Western world. The birds are attacking now, it's that time of night when the magpies come out. Teachers evaluating their impact. Sitting in a room, evaluating their impact with each other has the biggest effect on kids, and they're not even present. The high expectations of, of teachers, and when teachers tend to have high expectations, they have it for all the students and are successful. And teachers with low expectations tend to have it for all the students and are not and so on down that list. Here's the point. I'm gonna make one switch. It's the same message with parents. The database is as extensive. I've only got about 30 million of the database, not 350 million. But the messages are the same. And that's what I want to explore today when I look at the 10 mind frames. What's the nature of the data? Well, over all the family effects, 0.16. Now, some of you will get upset at the moment and say, no, families are more important. Now, remember what I'm talking about as learners. Sorry. Overall, on average, they're not. But we need to be careful of the flaw of the average. The details matter. When I look specifically at some of the effects, again, you can see socioeconomic status screaming up. But I've already hinted. We have to be careful. And you look down to see involvement. But once again, let's be careful. What do we mean by parental involvement? So let's get underneath and look at some of these mind frames. Yes, the home overall on average, but it doesn't mean that the home can't be very influential in learners. Love, caring and high expectations are not reserved and not dictated to by postcode. The resources, Yes, they may be powerful, but the expectations, or as Kevin called them, aspirations, are far more powerful. And particularly when we look at progress compared to achievement. Yeah, you can look at the NAPLAN scores of Australia by state or by within state. And they're very good indicators of real estate prices. But that's not what schools are about. Schools are about adding value. Schools are about progress. And we look at measures of progress and the value that we add to kids, that is completely unrelated to postcode. In fact, I can show you some evidence that if we take the bottom half of distribution of kids' achievement across Australia, we'd rank in the top three to five in the world in terms of how we're good at educating those kids. Pretty impressive, actually. And it's probably no surprise that your influence in the family as parents declines as your students get older. I know Kyle's sitting there on this call and he knows that's absolutely true at age 30. So let's look at the first mind frame. Do you have, as parents, appropriately high expectations? 
Let's look at the effect size of the expectations of teachers in general on kids, 0.42. Those teachers who have high expectations, wow, it doubles. <laughs> Pretty impressive. What about parent expectations? Yes, very powerful. One of the strongest influences of parents is the expectations they have of their students to be learners. But even higher than this, so much higher than any of those three are the expectations of the students. If students think they're dumb, that is the biggest handicap to their learning. If students aren't given opportunities to learn, struggle and fail in a trusting environment, they're gonna have very strong expectations. And one of the things that we should have right across South Australia is never have the motto that you're gonna help your child reach your poten his potential or her potential. Our job is to help kids exceed what they think is their potential. And that is the enormous power of expectations. Now, of course, if you have high expectations, our job then is to help our children realize those expectations as learners. And when we look at the difference between high and low expectations, we can see dramatic differences in the nature of what happens in those two kinds of classrooms and those two kinds of families, simply as a function of the expectations we have. And when you look down the high expectation list, you can see that it's pretty obvious why those, those kids are incredible learners and kids on the other side and below, they're not learners. Uh, at best compliance and at worst disruptive. And then how do we turn those expectations into reasonable demands and being highly responsive? And you're gonna see like Dr. Spock used to say, see it through the child's eyes. We all know about the types of parents out there. And we can have a fun job as I've done here, coming up with different kinds of names for different kinds of parents. I want a highly responsive parent, responsive to the child. Yes, we all want our children responsive to us, but great parenting is a function of us being responsive to them. And when I look at the jargon in this area, and it's been around a long time, even in Kevin's day, we use this notion of authoritarian, permissive and authoritative parents. And if you're like me, I get very confused between authoritarian and authoritative. And if I asked you as a parent, where do you fit? But no surprise, the top grouping is the one that have the best learners and develop the best learners. I've renamed it. I call it the reasoning and listening. I think we underestimate the power of listening. When you listen to someone, and particularly when you demonstrate you've understood what you've listened to, what an incredible mark of respect. And this is what we need to do with children. Demonstrate we've listened to them. Notice I, I haven't said we have to agree with them. It's not about being authoritarian. It's listening. And that power of listening is so, so powerful. And that's what comes with the warmth, the reasoning, the participation, and the easygoing. So once again, it's that mind frame. It's that way of thinking that I am a reasoning and listening parent when I go into discussions and negotiations with my children. And this notion that I, the parent, loves learning. Now, notice I'm saying I love learning. It's not about achievement, it's learning. Take, for instance, employment rates. Over the last 50 years, and you can see up in the top right hand corner there the employment rates, and this is across the US. Those people who graduate from our schools and homes that have high content area, and I've used maths, it could have been physics or English or music or panel meeting, it doesn't matter. But if they have high content area and high social skills, they're very employable, employment rates have gone up. And no surprise, low content, and low social skills, the employment rate's gone down. But look in the middle. Those graduates that have lower content, but higher social skills are employable. But those who have higher content and lower social skills are not. What employers are asking for now, not in the future, is they want team players. They want communicators. They want translators. They want graduates who can negotiate with people from incredibly diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences. We need to do that in our families, in our schools right now. But so often, 
when parents choose schools, they choose schools on the basis of the friends they want their students to have. They choose like, and that is a real problem if we're gonna make our students employable. We're gonna to have to show our students how to work in groups. And we just produced a book this year, pointing out the psychological skills that are necessary to teach kids how to work in groups. You don't just put them in a group. 90 odd percent of kids in Australian schools sit in groups and work alone. No, this is deliberately teaching them to work in groups. Even we as adults sometimes struggle to work in groups and have the confidence to contribute to groups. And it's this notion of, can we teach our children to stand in other people's shoes and see their worldview? Well, the way it starts is by us standing in our children's views and seeing their worldview. Understanding how they're going about thinking, about how they're going about reasoning and decision-making. Once again, you don't have to agree with them, but not rushing in with a solution, but seeing learning through their points of view. And many of you in COVID teaching, as parents saw, the incredible positive nature of struggle. I remember in the early days of COVID, quite a few parents were a bit distraught with schools because the work's too difficult. Well, come on guys, if the work's too easy and they're getting right answers, they don't need to do it. You don't go to school to learn that which you know, it's what you don't know. Similarly in the home, it's about what you don't know. So have you got high trust? Have you got lots of thinking allowed? thinking aloud so you could hear the processing. Like I call my work visible learning, not because learning is always visible, it's not actually, but I wanna make it more visible so we can hear the processes. Because sometimes with the children, it's about showing them different ways of doing the task, not right or wrong, and how we can turn struggle into the most positive word in our learning dictionary. In our book, Kyle and I have gone back to gaming and all the video games. And they've got it pretty right about how they capture our kids. So we thought, well, what are their principles? And you can see our 15 principles up there of gaming. And I have to confess, I'm a bit of a, um, an addict at Angry Birds. And what happens, as you know, is they know when I start the game, my prior achievement, my last score. They also know the Goldilocks principle of setting up challenge. Not too hard, not too easy, and not too boring. And then they provide me with an incredible amount of opportunity to deliberately practice. And I say deliberately practice because in the practice, I get lots of feedback about how good I'm going at getting to the next level. And what happens is not what many parents do. If the kids don't succeed in the session, they say, oh, you did your best, well done. Probably the worst thing you could ever say to a child ever is do your best. Because sometimes your best's not good enough. No, those games keep it there and the kids know that they're gonna to have to go into this learning game. And then when they get to the next level, again, not like many teachers and parents, we say, well done, you got there, hand it in, now go it out and play. No, those video games raise the level and your kids and me are absorbed in the game of learning. Wow, do we have a lot to learn about making sure that we understand what the kid brings into any situation. How to set success criteria that meet the Goldilocks principle, not too hard, not too easy, not too boring. And then how to help deliberately practice the child and not allow them to come up with 53 reasons why they're not good enough, which lowers their expectations, but at the opposite, enjoy the struggle of learning. And this power of feedback, incredibly powerful, one of the most strongest influences on kids' learning, but also one of the most variable. A third of feedback we give children in classrooms has a negative effect. I give a feedback to one student, it works. I give the same feedback to another student, it doesn't. And understanding that variability is what matters. And that's what I've been focused on for the last 20 years in my work. And one of the answers to solving that variability is that when you ask adults what they mean by feedback, they say it's corrections, it's comments, it's clarifications, it's constructive criticism. But when you ask students and children in homes about what they mean by feedback, they don't say any of that. They say feedback helps me where I go next. 
And if there is no where to go next feedback, I have sat with students with two pages of written comments and they look me in the face and say, I got no feedback. Because to them, there was nothing in there that helped them where to go next. Same in the home with parents. It's parent, parenting that looks at helping the kids where to go next. Now, there's nothing wrong with that other kind of feedback. It's the pedestal to where to go next. But I ask you to check next time you give feedback to your student and to your child at home. If there's no where to next, most of the feedback they get costs. They have to do it again. It wasn't good enough. It's a reflection on their lack of skill and ability. But if they have the where to next as well, it makes the difference. And look at the second part of the mind frame, errors. Feedback thrives on mistakes, not knowing. If you get it right, feedback doesn't have much effect. So how do parents handle mistakes? Like we know in classrooms, when a child puts the hand up and they get the wrong answer, 50% of the time, the teacher corrects that child. 50% of the time, that teacher asks another kid to correct that child. 3% of the time, the teacher uses that error as an opportunity to learn. Not much different in many homes. We need to look at the dignity of risk. How do we allow children to take risks? And we all know how protective our society is becoming now. And it's kind of ironical that the, those parents who think their children are at most risk, who drive them to school rather than to let them to school, it's directly inversely correlated with the safety of the community. The more safe the community, the more parents are concerned about those things. It has got a massive flow on effect to our students. And so I wanna reintroduce the dignity of risk and teaching students the coping strategies to deal with risk, not get rid of the risk. Carol Dweck did a great study, three-year-old kids. And she asked parents and watched what they did when there was failure in the situation. They set up scenarios where there was failure. And what she found was that those three-year-olds in families where positive, failure was seen as positive and could be used, it was seen as facilitating growth and so on, those kids at age 15 were our successes, regardless of their ability. One of the best predictors was their ability at the early ages to deal with failures. So the next time you rush in to help your child get it right, and not wallow in the pit of not knowing, remember the damage you're causing down the line. Yes, you'll get more compliance, but you'll also get students who will struggle with failure. It's a bit like, why is it that most gifted kids don't become gifted adults? Less than two, 2% 2 of child prodigies go on to be gifted adults. Because when they get to the ages of 14, 15, 16, and they're forced to do topics that they're not brilliant at, they have no concept of dealing with failure. I have three sons. Kyle's one of them, and they were brought up North Carolina in primary school. And it's 1990s, and their biggest hero was Michael Jordan. And this was the poster I put on their wall. And now that I've got four granddaughters, I'm looking for a female role, role model to say the same thing. So if you know one, let me know. Failure is a learner's best friend. Now your parents, you're not teachers. And one of our arguments in the book is parents aren't first teachers. That leads to massive role demarcation, clarification problems down the line. Parents are first learners. And we have to be very clear what the role of the parents is and what the teacher is. And schools, particularly during COVID, have learned how to capitalize on parents as learners much more than they've ever done. And I hope we don't forget this. The language of learning is what we need to worry about to teach our parents. How we teach that, we did a study many years ago with the five lowest socioeconomic schools uh, in New Zealand. And a lot of projects were put into place, a lot of resources in place. And at the end, we titled our report, When Parents Learn the Language of Learning. Because that was the difference. And those parents learned what it meant to be a learner today, even though they all went to school. Some of them didn't have great experiences at school, but when they saw their child learning and all of them wanted to help their child, some just didn't know how. And we said, 
This is what it's about. Learn the language of learning. Learn how to work and struggle. Learn how to talk and seek help and do these kinds of things. We had stunning differences. And so part of this mind frame is about choosing schools. And I came up with these 10 ways of learning schools. I published it in a magazine a few years ago. I got into big, big troubles with the school sector because they said, these are all the wrong answers. This is not what parents should be doing. But in our book, we explore. We look at how to choose a school. We have another section on how to choose a preschool. And if you go down that list, you'll see it's about learning. It's about safety to not know. It is about how students can learn with peers because they're gonna learn with their peers anyway, but how to make that a positive and how to look at feedback. I know Carl's sitting there now, now saying, every night at the tea table, they, my kids got asked the same question. What do you ask your kids? What did, did you do at school today? Please don't do that. You're part of the problem if you're doing it. You're privileging the what. I ask my kids every day, what feedback did your teachers give you today? I want them to be listeners. Or at least once a day to listen to the feedback, if for no other reason to shut that old man up at the tea table, but to turn them into listeners of feedback. Because listening, feedback is powerful to the degree it is heard, understood, and actionable. Very, very powerful. And language. There's a lot of work, particularly in the early years. Discussions about play. I'm not a great fan of play because a lot of play has no language. The easiest way of choosing a preschool is simple. Walk into the preschool, walk into the home and count the language and send your kid where there's the most language. You know what it's like, hey, you have a three-year-old granddaughter, I've got two three-year-old granddaughters. They're obsessed with why questions. They're curious, they wanna know, they wanna build a theory of the world. Why is it by age eight? They switch to what questions? Let me give you one study. This, this group looked at a group of kids from lower socioeconomic resource families. And they looked at families from higher social resource families, probably like yours and mine, many of us today. And they looked at the language and the number of words that the children in the two groups of families had heard. Not the number of unique words, but how many words in total had they been exposed to? Just count all the words. By age five, what do you think the difference is in the number of words they heard? Not individual words, not words they spoke, but words they're being exposed to, sometimes many, many times. In the higher resource family to the lowest resource family. I might make an estimate. The number of words that your five-year-old was exposed to compared to lower socioeconomic status. 45 million. And more, 75% of the words that the higher resource family was affirming, positive and supportive, and 60% in the lower resource family was negative constraining. That language. Now, regardless of the resource of the family, let me be clear, when the language was strong and dominant and plenty of it, then social economic status had no effect. And so how do we make language, language and language the major message, particularly about the preschool years. Sadly, some parents speak to the dog more than the kid. That's what we have to change. That's where the power of preschool is, that power of language. And the last one I wanna to come to is, is probably the most critical. Let me start with classrooms. When a teacher walks into a classroom, I want them to say, my job here today is to evaluate my impact. And then all the good things in the visible learning research follow. It's that teacher mind frame. Now, of course, it begs the question, impact about what? Impact for how many students? And how much impact? And it begs the question about what we mean by an evaluator, and what we call evaluative thinking. And remember that word evaluator has the word value in it. We're making hierarchical decisions about what we value when we ask about the merit, worth and significance of our actions. And so when we're engaging as parents with our students, the degree to which we're clear about what kind of impact we have, 
the degree to which us children are clear about the nature of the impact that we intend. But I don't have to agree with it. There may be negotiations, there may be reasoning, there may be times when we have to stand in their shoes to see their view of impact and what they understand by what we mean. This is why we're so obsessed with the notion of success criteria. Telling students, telling children up front what success looks like so they don't have to guess what's in our brain. They know when's good's good enough. And what's more, the more they know what success looks like, the more any teaching or feedback or interactions with they have with their students is interpreted as, oh, that's how I go next, where to next, to get to success. If there is no success criteria, the information they're receiving can be random. It can be misheard, not heard. And remember, kids are like us. They are brilliant at selective listening. And so how do we get this notion of evaluating our impact? Making sure that we constantly say, well, when I had that discussion with the child, how did I go? So we're getting feedback about our success. Sometimes we need to stop and ask our children and our students, tell us how you're going, which is a statement about how I'm going. Getting their voice about what progress. If they think they're not making progress, they're probably not. And that triangulation of their views about progress your views about progress and any artifacts of what they're actually doing about progress is the interpretations that we need to make and often need to share with our students and our children about how we're making those evaluative judgments. We demand they make those evaluative judgments when they go on the internet. We demand when they sit down and we ask them, to do your homework or do your schoolwork for them to make evaluative judgments about what's valuable and what's not valuable. And remember, every child, Every child has an incredible amount of motivational resources. Some of them just choose to use it this way rather than that. And anyone who says the child is lazy, they're not prepared to put in the effort, a misunderstanding. It's not about whether we push or pull them. It's about it making it attractive for them to want to invest in their learning. And one of the ways to make it attractive is to have that high sense of high expectations, very clear success criteria, and listening and helping the students where to next to attain those success criteria. So it's all about impact. It's all about starting with the premise, Dr. Spock, I actually know more than I think I do. And there is no one right way to do this. It is about how we think. And I, again, acknowledge Kevin's incredible pedestal that he set up for us all and how we've drifted away from his major themes as we've talked about structures of homes, about the nature of families, about the welfare, the immigration, the refugees, as if those are the matters that really matter. It's not. It's those high expectations. It's that evaluating that impact. It is making failure our children's best friend. It is wallowing in the pit of learning with them that makes the difference. Parents are the child's first learners. That's my message, and again, Thank you, Kevin. Absolutely. And I might just pick it up there. Thank you, John, for that really thought provoking and um, uh, presentation in particular, and also really beautifully connected with um, Kevin Marchbank's research and those themes and those 10 mind frames. I'm sure there are lots of uh, parents on this call looking at the uh, on the uh, uh, comments in the chat function as well. And I encourage people, if you want to post some questions, we will get through them now. But I've got a question for you first, starting, John. Um, you picked up on the uh, research of Carol Dweck, who's probably most known for her <coughs> research on praise. And I'm just really curious to hear your thoughts on, on where you think praise and feedback fits within these mind frames that you've shared with us. Well. When you look at the research on growth mindset, the effect size is incredibly low. And I had the occasion of inviting Carol to come out to Australia for a conference. And I, uh, I thought, oh, she's going to say no. Um, she's got so many things to do, etc. 30 seconds later after the email, she came back and said yes. And so we've become very good friends. And I had to think of a way of saying to her, I'm sorry, but the growth mindset stuff is just not working. And so I worked out a way of doing it. And I said to her, I'm not sure 
there's such a thing as a growth mindset. And you, you know, Carol, uh, Matthew, that steely gaze came around and she said, John, a growth mindset is the most fixed mindset of the lot. She said, I've never said there was a growth mindset. She said, I said, the circumstances are when a growth versus a fix makes a difference. And so I went a step further at that point and I brought out a folder of every article she'd ever written. And I said, Carol, I can actually tell you that concept that time. When we, when children are struggling, don't know, confused, anxious, lacking confidence, then having a growth versus a fixed mindset makes a difference. And she said, that's what I've been saying for years. That's my whole argument. All these people have picked up my work and said, we've got to teach kids about not yet and right brain and left. She said, it's nonsense. And she's fighting a very hard battle. She's also, as you've said, done a lot of work on praise. And we've talked at length about that because I take the view that praise dilutes the power of feedback. Simple. Matthew, I loved what you did this morning on that work you did. You got this there, but you got this wrong. And we're going to have to do a bit more work on this. But I love the effort you're putting in. You're a great student. I wait a day. I then ask you, what did you remember about the feedback I told you? Now, if you're like most people, you'll remember the praise. The feedback was diluted. Now, I want pe parents and teachers to not give praise and feedback about the task at the same time. But that is not saying that we shouldn't praise kids. Heaven help us. We like praise. Why shouldn't kids? It's the essence of relationships. It builds up those sense of confidence and trust. So there's a time for praise and there's not a time for praise. Don't, when you're talking to children, praise the heck out of them and then tell them they did something bad. Because what they did bad, it'll be forgotten in a few moments as they go to the other side of it. Keep the conversation about the task and keep the conversation about the attributes of the child separate. Do it separately. So yeah, praise matters, but at the right time. Thanks, John. A follow-up to that question draws upon... Uh what seems to be the discourse in education at the moment, which is so accomplishment driven. But uh, one of the questions is around your term of wallowing in the pit and what that actually means and how this links to a love of learning. Can you just tell us a little bit more of your reflections around what, what you actually mean by wallowing in the pit and how parents can support learning and teaching in schools uh, for students to grow? But the notion of wallowing in the pit, there's a right time to do it. Like after, in a class, after a student has learned the content, at a home, after the student has understood the task and has got the sufficient skills to do it, not before, then it's okay to go into the pit. And in the pit, this is where you may work with others, you may work with other siblings, kids, you may do it by yourself. This is the trial and error. This is the time where you actually explore ideas. This is when you seek alternatives and try them out. Now, at some point, you may need a safety net to come out of the pit. But there's nothing wrong, incredibly powerful, to put kids in situations where they have to work out the problem, let alone the solution. Now, I'm trying to be clear here, Matthew, that there's a right time to do it, and that's the skill. It's not getting them to do it when they know nothing, when they have to learn content. It's after they've got those skills, giving them that opportunity. And that's where the dignity of risk, that's where so much goes on. Now, there's nothing wrong when they come out of the pit or you want to slip in the pit with them to say, tell us how you're thinking. Not tell us what you're doing. Tell us how you're thinking. One of the biggest issues about going in the pit is working out what the problem is. And having used the learning pit for many, many years, oh my goodness, kids love going in the learning pit. They love the fact there's a safety net coming up. They love the fact that it's okay to fail. So very powerful notion. John, a follow-up to this is a, is a really thought-provoking question, given the disruption of COVID in the last 18 months in particular. But in your research and, and co-authoring this book um, in particular, what's been the biggest surprise in the research that you've undertaken for it, and also reflecting on your research in the, in the light of COVID, and also the impact of so many people um, working from home, seeing their kids more, and uh, the intersection there with teaching and, and learning as well. Matthew, we, I've written an article. Um, there's a free article on the web. If you look it up, it's called Ode to Expertise, where I've looked at um, seven studies that have been done since COVID, including, believe it or not, a meta-analysis, and seven studies looking at social emotional learning, which is your area. And the observation is that if you look at the effects of what happened in 2020, it's slightly negative. But that doesn't mean that 
learning went down, it meant the usual gain that we make to kids from one beginning of the year to the next year was slightly lower. And that lower effect is about the same effect size that you get from the summer school loss, hardly at all. And so the whole theme of this ode is to recognize the excellence of what teachers did to maintain learning growth under incredible circumstances, massive equity problems, death, unemployment. What an incredible opportunity. And part of what happened also, Matthew, is that many parents realized the incredible expertise of teachers. Like they dealt with their one or two preferences in the home. And some teachers, like high school teachers, deal with 200 kids a day for 200 days a year. And they do a lot more than babysitting. They add incredible value. Parents also learned about the language of learning. That struggle was a good thing. That getting it right meant the work was too easy. So I think parents learned a tremendous amount. I think the interaction of parents and teachers was so much more positive. Now, I don't want to generalize to every kid. Let's be careful here. But it was a pretty powerful message. And part of my argument is that we need to learn about those good things that happen so that when we go back to the classroom, we don't go back. We actually go back better. And so I think we've got a lot to learn about COVID that's very, very positive. And so I'm working very hard to make sure that the biggest travesty of COVID is we go back to the old normal. Mm. Not good enough. So that's my major message about COVID is we've got a lot of good stuff to learn. We engage with parents totally differently. We did a study a few years ago, Matthew, where we um, got 300 schools to send us their school reports. They sent home a couple of times a year. On the basis of that, 98% of kids in Australia are achieving well, putting in an effort and a pleasure to teach. It's a public relations lie. That did not happen during COVID. We learned so much more about parents and how they can help learners and how parents can work with teachers about the language of learning. Thanks, John. And I've got one more question for you. And it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting one. I want to link back to your slide on Michael Jordan and uh, his shots around failure um, to get the perfect um, sort of shot in basketball. And one of the things which I did jump over about Kevin's early teaching career was that he was a very fine coach of a third 11 cricket team, apparently. Um, in his early career, that was something that he was very, very good at. And it's in all of his early uh, records as a teacher, that he was obviously a really brilliant mathematics teacher. And that's what he was plucked out for and then went off to Harvard and, and the rest is history. But he obviously really recognized something very interesting about the third 11 cricket team, just as with other sports people who perhaps struggle with the mastery. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts and reflections on the struggle towards mastery and learning and teaching. And perhaps the education of the whole child. Well, like Kevin, I'm very proud of the fact that um, my first year as a coach of 11 year old cricket teams, I got the bottom team and I had 13 kids. And I'm very proud of the fact that at age 19, I handed over 11 of those kids to the next team. I kept them together for 10 years. What, the, the best year we ever had was the year we lost every game. It is about that team building that feeding off others, working out when you can get small successes and treat them as, as, as victories, learning from the failure. And so I'm with Kevin on that. It is about those uh, interactions. And in our world today, with our incredible diversity in front of us, we need to embrace that diversity and treat our kids to learn in that diversity. And that's one of my worries with families. We're closing down more and more as the world gets more open to have very, very local circumstances. And COVID has not helped that. It's interesting when you look at the evidence on COVID, the reason kids want to go back to school is overwhelming their friends. It's not to go back and learn the stuff we teach them. Friendship, incredibly powerful. The biggest predictor of success when a kid changes a school, changes a teacher, goes back after COVID, is do they make a friend in the first month? Wow, that's so powerful. I'm sorry, I've slightly drifted off your question, but good opportunity to... I just have one question to ask. I know we're nearly out of time, but one of the things I've observed over many years working in education is that um, a very rich experience used to happen in classrooms around play. And I have seen a play curriculum disappear from classrooms. And during play, you can achieve with kids all the sorts of things you were talking about, like taking risks, praise, listening, working in groups. 
uh, and all these sorts of wonderful things and seeing kids succeed. And you walk into schools and classrooms now and I don't see structured or unstructured play programs and it just sort of saddens me a bit. But it, one of the questions on the chat sort of also builds on this notion. And um, the question is, how do we encourage children to take risks and have alternative solutions when we have standardised testing throughout life that determines one's success or failure. I wonder if you could comment on that. Firstly on play, uh, we've overplayed, sorry, we've overdone the play notion and we've seen play as the critical element. I don't. I see language as the critical element, but I'm with you. You can do a lot of language in play. Play is a very good mechanism to increase the amount of interaction and the language and the different ways of thinking. And the same way with Matthew's question, a lot of sports and engagements like that, it is about language, it is about this. And so if we had pushed language and play as a mechanism, I think we'd be in a healthy situation. Unfortunately, too many people push play and it's seen as irrelevant and not necessary. And I'm with you, I think that's very sad. But then I come to the other part of it is that you know our love in Australia of standardized national testing and achievement. And I, I, I've argued many times that our love of standards and high achievement is killing us as a nation. When I look at the distribution of every school in Australia in NAPLAN, and I plot it by achievement, by growth, 50% of our schools are in the crossing zone. The kids are above average and they're not getting that year's growth for a year's input. That's what's killing us. And when I speak to those schools, they say, and those parents, they say, but what's the problem? My kid's bright, gonna get in the university they want. And I look around and say, but no, because we're not growing those kids, we actually allow them to cruise. Our country's gone backwards dramatically at PISA. And as I said before, I, if you take kids below average, and I've certainly looked at this in South Australia, we have the best teachers in the world at our below schools with kids that start below average. I think we've got a long way to a long way to go to turn around our rhetoric. Our rhetoric should be about growth schools, not about high achieving schools. Mm, great. Look, we'll have to end here, but um, we do have three suggestions on the chat line for you for a female role model. Oh, good. Yeah, so we have Ash Barty, uh, JK Rowling, and Ashley Nelson, the hockey player. Well, if someone knows Ash Barty, I'd love to talk to her. I've been be prepared to put some words in their mouth that said, talks about the success of failure because yeah. uh, I need it for my granddaughters. Yes, you do. Um, so thank you very much, uh, John, for your talk tonight. Um, um, I've really thoroughly enjoyed um, listening to you. You provoked some thoughts and that's what these talks are all about is to get us thinking and talking to our co colleagues at school and work tomorrow, uh, talking to parents in different ways. So thank you very much for stimulating that um, the tape, the recording of the lecture will be on the School of Education website at the University of Adelaide. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge again the March Banks family uh, and thank you very much for attending and supporting this biannual uh, oration. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>